That completes the epidermis. Now we can see what's underneath. The dermis is composed of connective tissue. It has a papillary layer, which is the upper layer that's more superficial, and the reticular layer, which is deep and forms the vast majority of the dermis. The papillary layer is just that upper area where we have those finger-like extensions. From lab, the dermal papilla, that's the papillary layer where all those little finger-like extensions are located. Here's a cross-section view of a small piece of skin. You see how it points to the epidermis as this tiny purple layer? Everything we've been looking at can basically be stuck in that tiny purple layer. The epidermis is actually very thin. The papillary dermis is the section that has that bumpy or the finger-like extensions of the dermal papilla. Below that, we have hair follicles and sebaceous glands located in the reticular dermis. This is where most of those structures are present, as well as our nice blood vessels. Deep to that, we have the hypodermis. The papillary layer is that upper part of the dermis which is composed of areolar connective tissue. It has the dermal papilla. Epidermal ridges and papilla are going to interlock and hold together. That way you don't accidentally rip off the epidermis of your skin. It also houses blood capillaries and nerve endings. The blood capillaries are those that actually nourish the basal strap. The blood capillaries here are those that nourish the epidermis and the nerve endings are helping us with our sensations. We've talked a lot about the stratum corneum and the epidermis, but why do your fingerprints have those strange little ridges on them that show up in different patterns like the arch or the whirl or the double whirl? These patterns are actually produced by ridges called primary and secondary ridges. The epidermis goes to different depths with these, and the stratum corneum begins to pile up on certain sections. And when the stratum corneum piles up a little higher, it forms ridges. Our fingertips are also covered in sweat glands that come and empty out onto the top of the ridges. That's why your hands can get sweaty so quickly. Do you want to see how that happens for real? Let's watch this video of the fingertip ridges beginning to sweat. I think it makes my fingers sweaty just watching this. That's it for the papillary layer. Now we're on to the reticular. The reticular layer is the majority of the dermis. It is composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. It has a little more strength than our areolar tissue in the papillary layer. The associated epithelial structures that we are going to see are hair follicles, sebaceous and sweat glands, and nerves and blood vessels. The connective tissue in the dermis is going to have collagen and elastin present. That gives it a little bit of strength and stretch. So if you pull on your skin, it can kind of bounce back into shape. Um, whenever you're younger, you have a lot more of the elastic and fibers and the collagen. When as you get older, your skin starts to kind of, this breaks that down a little bit, doesn't replace it as well, and then you're going to start to get wrinkles because that collagen and elastin in the dermis start to wear out. But if you're young, it's excellent condition, and you have a nice, smooth, wrinkle-free face. Talking about these tissues, let's review really quick the types of connective tissue that we saw. We saw areolar connective tissue. That's what we see in the papillary layer. The adipose tissue that's composed of fat cells. And then we saw a couple more like in the spleen. We also saw dense regular connective tissue. 
and dense irregular. Dense regular tissue has all of the fibers going in the same direction, and this just makes the tissue stronger. Irregular has the fibers going in all of different directions, very random. So it's not quite as strong as the dense regular. Here's a different view of the skin, but this is what we've been looking at so far. The epidermis, the dermis, the hypodermis, and the muscle layer below that. Going down into the deepest part, that is called the subcutaneous layer, or the hypodermis. This is technically deep to the integument, so it's not a part of the integument, it's below it. This is composed of areolar and adipose connective tissue. Also a really good site for the sub-Q or subcutaneous injection of drugs because it has such an extensive vascular network. There's a lot of blood vessels present in the subcutaneous or hypodermis. Looking at that picture again of your skin, we see the epidermis is the little line on top, followed by the papillary dermis, then the majority is that reticular dermis with its structures, Below that is the subcutaneous, and then a muscle layer, and a little more connective tissue below that. And we focus so long on the epidermis, it's always kind of shocking to see that picture. Like, how was that so little? This table from your textbook summarizes the three different sections. Any changes in your skin color can be a sign of an underlying problem. Cyanosis is whenever you have bluish colored skin. Sometimes you'll see this on fingertips. This indicates poor circulation and deoxygenated blood. Jaundice is when you have yellowish skin and yellow whites of your eyes. Possibly this is from a liver problem. A hematoma is a bruise. It's having those black and bluish marks. That's all from the blood that's underneath the skin. Lastly, there is something called albinism. This is whenever there is a total lack of pigment due to non-functional protein, making you unable to produce melanin. Melanin gives color, so without any melanin, the whole skin, the hair, your eyebrows, your eyelashes, everything is without pigment. Moving on to integumentary structures. These are derived from the epidermal epithelium, and they're located in the dermis. You would think that something that was in the dermis would have arisen there, but all of these structures, your nail, your hair, and your exocrine glands, are all actually composed of or derived from the epidermal epithelium. They've just moved down into the dermis. Your nail is actually being formed at the nail matrix. The root of it is up there by the matrix and it pushes forward down the length of the nail. Your nails are scale-like modifications of stratum corneum. They are composed of dead, keratinized epithelial cells they're being produced at that nail matrix, then pushing forward. The function is to protect the digit and to aid you in grasping. In animals, we'll typically see more of an offensive use of them if they're claws, but in humans, they are pretty much just there for protection and just to aid you. Or to, I don't know, pick at something. Because your body is always producing that nail, if anything happens where you're not having the proper minerals or something is affecting your ability to produce those keratinized cells, you're going to see malformations of the nails. So you can actually diagnose diseases because of nails. That's it for nails. Let's talk about hair next. Hair is made up of dead keratinized cells. They grow from a hair follicle located in the dermis. You have two types of hair. Vellus hair, which is downy and short. If you feel your cheek right now and you feel those little bitty light fuzzies, those are vellus hairs. They're very soft. 
They also don't have a lot of pigment in them, so they're almost transparent. Terminal hairs are coarse and pigmented. They're the ones that if you touch someone's beard, that's all the terminal hairs. Hairs will actually transition from vellus hairs to terminal hairs as you go through puberty. So if you have a boy, he has a face covered in vellus hairs, and slowly, little by little, and one by one, those vellus hairs turn into terminal hairs, and suddenly they have pigment, they're very coarse, and they can grow long. There are three layers to your hair. The inner core is called the medulla. That is surrounded by the cortex, which forms the majority of the hair. And then the cuticle is the outermost layer. Next time you see a shampoo commercial, and they show you those animations for how the shampoo works, and you see it kind of working on the outside of the hair, that's aimed at the cuticle. They want to smooth that, oil it, and basically keep it in good condition so the hair itself doesn't break. Your hair is composed of three zones. The shaft is the portion of the hair that extends beyond the skin surface. So what you can see of a hair is the shaft. The root goes from the surface of the skin down to the bulb, and the bulb is the very base. It surrounds that little hair follicle as it starts to grow. The hair matrix is inside of the bulb, and it consists of a dividing epithelial cells. Deep in that matrix, all of these little cells keep getting replicated, and as they produce more and more, it pushes the other ones up, eventually pushing them from the root out to the shaft. Maybe, I don't know, a few centimeters a year? There's a specialized muscle that you and I, we rarely get any good use out of it, but think about a cat. Whenever a cat gets scared, what happens? It arches its back and all of its hair stands up. And that cat looks like it's pretty much twice the size that it was before it fluffed itself up. The cat used its erector pili muscles. These tiny muscles are at the base of every single hair follicle, and whenever they contract, they actually make the hair stand upright. So on a cat, that would be very impressive. On you, uh, you have goosebumps. That's what it gives you. It gives humans goosebumps. We're not as impressive. The other structure inside of the dermis is going to be exocrine glands. These consist of some of the glands we already saw in lab. A merocrine sweat gland. These secrete to the surface and are involved in thermoregulation. An apocrine sweat gland located on your underarm. They secrete to hair follicles and those secretions, if they combine with bacteria, give us the bad odor of your underarms. So it's not actually your secretions that stink. It's that the bacteria eat on them, and then what the bacteria produces stinks. So if anybody says you have bad body odor, it's really your bacteria. If it makes you feel any better. <laughs> and there is one last. Lastly, there are sebaceous glands. The sebaceous glands are located at the base of the hair follicles, and they have their secretion onto the hair itself. Now, merocrine glands, if you recognize them, are the sudoriferous glands that we saw in lab. Do you know someone with acne? Are you someone with acne? Let's look at how acne actually occurs. Your sebaceous glands are at the base of every hair follicle, and they're always secreting this oil that coats the hair, but sometimes they can get plugged up. If it gets plugged, everything the sebaceous gland is producing just begins to collect under the surface. It doesn't stop producing its secretion. It doesn't know that it's plugged. So it just produces more and more, and you have this bulb forming under the surface, just all this collected sebaceous, until finally you have to pop it because you can't resist. Your skin is taking a lot of damage in life. You scrape your knee, you pick at that acne spot too much, damage occurs and the body has to repair it. 
It can repair it through regeneration. This is doable if you have a small amount of damage and you just replace those damaged or dead cells with new ones. The other option is fibrous. This is when it's too large of an area that's been damaged to actually replace, but we can fill that in with scar tissue. We just lose some of those dermal structures. We may lose a proper functioning epidermis. That's why your scars might not have any hairs and may look different than the skin around it. Over time, our integument ages and kind of thins out. Wrinkling happens as the collagen fibers decrease, and through UV exposure, we tend to have increasing rates of skin cancer as we get older. Since we're talking about skin, let's look at burns real quick. Burns can result in fluid loss, infection, and have limited regeneration of that skin. There are three levels to burns. A first degree burn is only to the epidermis. If you've ever had a sunburn, you had a first degree burn. With first degree burns, you shouldn't see blisters. If the damage is worse and it continues into the dermis, then you have a second degree burn. With these, you're normally going to see the blistering. These can be quite extensive and they are very painful. The third degree burn is the worst though. This is a burn so severe that it went through the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous. In some cases, these burns reach the bone. They're very severe and hard to recover from as all of the structures in that dermis are going to be lost. We use the rule of nine to compare the severity of burns. Your body can be divided up into areas of either 9% or multiples of nine. This would be helpful in the treatment of burns if you kind of know what you're looking at. If you have your whole entire left leg is burned, that would be an 18% of your body. If it was one arm, we could be looking at 9%. And if you compare that to a child, the percentage numbers are a little different. But this just gives us a way to classify them. If the burn was over a large enough area, it may be useful to take skin from a healthy part of the body and graft it onto that section where basically the epidermis and dermis were both destroyed. The last thing we're going to go over is skin cancer. In part because of those sunburns. We are constantly bombarding our skin cells with UV radiation every time you go outside. Because of that, over time, those tiny mutations caused by the radiation can build up so that by the time you're 70 or 80, suddenly we're having skin cancers. There are three types of skin cancer. First, we have the basal cell carcinoma. This is the most common but if you're going to get a skin cancer, this is the one you want because it seldom metastasizes, which means it rarely has cells break off and travel through the blood or some other part of the body, and it doesn't start growing a tumor somewhere else. It just stays in that portion of the skin. As you might imagine, this is cancer of a basal cell, so they're located in the epidermis. Because there's no blood vessels inside of the epidermis, it's hard for them to travel very far and they're pretty high up, so it's easy for us to remove them. Squamous cell carcinoma is slower growing, but it can metastasize. These start to be able to travel around if they're severe enough. Lastly, we have the malignant melanoma. These are the scary ones. It is the most dangerous skin cancer because it aggressively metastasizes. It acts, it can be a traveling cancer going to other parts of the body and starting to replicate those cells. This is from your melanocyte. These are pictures of the three types of skin cancer. With the malignant melanoma, what we're really looking for is changes in color of a mole. Say it went from being one color of brown and now it's kind of mottled looking. Did its border change? Is it now in your regular shape instead of a nice round one? Is it appear to be growing? Those are all signs that we could be looking at a malignant melanoma. We use A, B, C, D, E to help us with this. Okay, 
that is the end of our integument. We really didn't end on a happy note, ending with skin cancer. But the good news is you now know to wear a hat and to use some sunscreen in the hopes that whenever you get older, you won't have skin cancer. I'm signing off and I'll see you on the next chapter.